Now, the, the first section, I've got four different little sections that I want to talk about. And the first one uh, is one of the great thought experiments of all time, in my view. And it, it was a paper published by Leslie Aiello and Peter Wheeler, and it was called the Expensive Tissue Hypothesis. And it has its origin in Kleiber's law. Now, Cli Max Kleiber was a Swiss physiologist who uh, taught at University of California at Davis for a long time in the late 30s, the 40s, and the 50s. And Dr. Kleiber was really interested in metabolism. And he ended up writing a, a, a famous... Am I pushing the right thing? A famous book called The Fire of Life, an introduction to animal energetics. And that's a copy of, of my book right there. When I was looking this up on Amazon, the only copy they had available was over $2,000. So I'm really glad I've got a pristine one. But anyway, what uh, Dr. Kleiber did is, is he was trying to find a correlation between metabolic rate and weight. And so he measured the metabolic rates of mice and horses and just about everything in between, and he came up with this graph, and this is the actual graph that was published in the, uh, in the physiological reviews uh, back in 1947. Back then they were a little bit primitive in their, in their publishing, and so this is actually a hand-drawn graph, and if you get that article, that's what you'll see. And what he found out is that there's a line, that there's a correlation that virtually every living thing falls on that's a function of metabolic rate and body weight. So if you can figure out the body weight on that line, you can figure out the metabolic rate and vice versa. And so if you look at it, humans fall right on that line, human males and human females. So this is where uh, Aiello and Wheeler took off on this. And they said, okay, let's, let's take a look. If we have a primate, okay, a 65 kilogram primate, What's it look like? If we break down all the components of its body and measure the metabolic rates of each one, how are they going to be spread out on, on this thing? And here they are. You've got the brain's got a little bit of, of uh, the metabolic rate. You've got the gut's got a whole lot. The liver's got a fair amount. The kidneys, the heart. The muscles, strangely enough, in terms of resting metabolic rate are, are not very much. They don't make up but about 4 or 5% of the total metabolic rate, the total resting metabolic rate. The brain makes up a huge amount in humans, and it makes up an okay amount in uh, primates, but there's a lot that the gut takes up because the gut is very metabolically active. So what, what they said is if a hominin, you know, a, a pre-human that weighed 65 kilograms would fit on Kleiber's line, that it ought to be about like this. And what they found out instead was that it looked like that. The brain chewed up a ton more of the metabolic rate and something had to give. And it couldn't be the heart, it couldn't be the kidneys, it couldn't be the spleen, it couldn't be really anything else, and what it ended up being was the GI tract. And so the, the, these uh, pre-humans basically sacrificed GI tract for brain because you can't, you're constrained by Kleiber's law. They couldn't just say, okay, we're going to keep our guts and raise our metabolic rates because we grow a bigger brain. They were, they were metabolically constrained by basically Kleiber's law. So... This is, uh, this is what happened. So what happened? What, ha what, what happened to the guts? Okay, if, if you look at this picture, you can see that, uh, that Homo sapiens has a hugely high uh, brain to gut ratio. Uh, and and the, the metabolic rate of the brain is about nine times higher than the mass specific metabolic rate of the body as a whole. And you can see the uh, that the, the Homo sapiens is way out here on this end, way away from everything. These are other primates. And if you look at the, at the chest cavities, you can see again that, that this, is, this is a chimpanzee over here. If you follow the sort of the line, you can see that they've got big bellies. This is an Australopithecus afarensis. That's Lucy. You can see again a, a, a big belly, but you can see the human the belly starts to narrow because it's not as large because they gave up their guts to develop larger brains. Now here are a bunch of primates and if you look at them you can see the same thing in each of them. They've got you know the makings of big bellies and the human has kind of got a waistline. Now <clears throat> if you look at uh, a gorilla 
you can see this in action. If you look at uh, chimpanzee, you can see the big belly. And if you look at uh, an Inuit from the late 1930s, you can see what a hunter-gatherer looks like. Now, this, this photograph was taken by a Norwegian whose name, a Norwegian friend told me how to pronounce it, Irene Hoyegård. And for obvious reasons, I'm gonna call him Hoygard. <laughs> but anyway, Hoygard took, uh, he, he was, a, as I say, he was a Norwegian physician, and he made this expedition that he funded to Greenland, to a remote area of Greenland, where there were Inuit that had not had contact with Europeans, and they were living in their traditional way. And so he ran every test imaginable on these people, and he actually took photographs of them, which is interesting, because I've been a doctor for over 35 years, and I've seen a lot of naked people in my time, but I've never seen a naked Inuit. And I've really never seen a naked Inuit that was living on a hunter-gatherer diet. And when you see them, and, he's, and, and he, the monograph he wrote, there are tons of pictures of both male and female. And these are people that are eating a very low carbohydrate, high fat diet. And, uh, and this guy is pretty typical. He's a 25 year old one. And you wouldn't, I mean, he doesn't look like a bodybuilder, but that's what all these people looked like. And the females kind of looked the same way, except they had breasts. And I mean, they wouldn't be recruited for uh, the Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition. And they were living on a strictly Paleolithic diet, which has caused me to wonder if, if the body ideal that we have, especially for females right now, is really realistic given our anthropological heritage. But at any rate, you can see the, the different waistlines in the different people or the different primates. Now, the reason they had such big bellies is because they had to, they had to eat a lot to sustain themselves if they didn't eat meat. Now, this is a little thing that I created. You know, I went through the USDA uh, nutrient database and put all these together. And if you're gonna get 65% of your calories from a 3,000 calorie diet, this is what you have to eat. Now, you don't have to eat all those, but you're gonna have to eat 10.3 pounds of carrots, or you're gonna have to eat 23 and a half pounds of tomatoes, six pounds of potatoes, 26 pounds of celery. And remember, these are all modern uh, vegetables. These have been Luther Burbanked. These are, are made to be big and, and more carby. If, if you found these things in the wild, they wouldn't be like this at all. <clears throat> and you'd have to eat a much larger volume to um, get the calories you need. So anyway, the, the only explanation for this shrinkage of the gut to go along with the increase in brain size is that they started to eat meat. And if you look at the if you look at the, the uh, hominid, hominin sort of increase in cranial capacity over time, you can see a real jump that takes off right here that uh, corresponds with starting to hunt large game. And so it's, it's the hunting, the conversion from a basically plant-based diet to a meat-based diet that allowed brains to grow and cause guts to shrink because we didn't need the gut because meat's a much more uh, complete food that doesn't require the same type of digestion that plant foods do. Now this is the uh, this is what uh, Ayo and Wheeler said is that you've got this this more complex uh, you got a higher quality diet because you're eating meat that allows you to have a smaller gut gives you increased energy availability to let you grow a larger brain and sort of the old way of thinking is that. The, there was more complex foraging behavior that, that people had to do as they developed, uh, and that drove the development of the larger brain. But, but they made the case that they thought it was the switch to meat consumption that drove the larger brain <coughs> formation. And so, <coughs> what it all boils down to is we didn't really evolve to eat meat, we evolved because we ate meat. And it was put much more eloquently by a friend of mine who wrote a great book that everyone should read. And she said, the wild herds of aurochs and horses invented us out of their bodies, their nutrient-dense tissues gestating the human brain. And that's exactly what happened. And if you know anybody that's a vegetarian that you want to break from it, get this book, The Vegetarian Myth by Lear Keith. It's absolutely wonderful, beautifully written. Okay, now, that's the Leslie Aguilar. Now, this is a great paper. 
and I'm going to have this available on my website if I don't already because everybody ought to have a copy of this, the expensive tissue hypothesis. And I spoke with, with Leslie Aiello about it, and she had a hell of a time getting it published. Uh, Current Anthropology, which was the journal it was published in, thought it was too complicated for their readers. And so she had a tough time getting it published, and now it's one of their most, if not need most, cited article in the, in the journal. Okay, I want to switch gears now and talk to stable, about stable isotope analysis.